Yeah, good morning, students. Welcome back to our Economics of uh, Regulation course. We already tried uh, in WebEx uh, and in particular in ClassX to introduce some questions just in order to get some feedback uh, and some interaction. Uh, what I showed you where was hopefully this, uh, this, this class X problem. Here again, what you can see, you just need this QR code in order, uh, in order to access this, this game. Uh, and and uh, today it's just service, as you saw, I just forgot to, to give you some space there. You can just enter something here, like, uh, should of course be the right kind of question. Uh, oh, and you should only have one here, uh, test two, and then only the first two, because the other I didn't manage, and then you just say Eingaben absent. And then you have to wait. And uh, as I can see here, uh, it's... <laughs> Three answered, okay, so three of nine. Uh, so I just want to give you another a few minutes to do that, or uh, if you don't do it right now, uh, we just evaluate, late, evaluate later. Uh, I would just want to go back to the lecture right now. Oh, actually, oh, I could just look what you wrote. Uh, oh, everyone. Oh. Great, at least one is sub-additivity, that's crazy. Uh, great. Uh, it can set uh, uh, the price as high as possible since demand won't reduce significantly. So these are two perfect answers. Uh, our first question was, oh, oh, I forgot the first question, which, co actually it's, it's, it's denoted here, which concept is used to define a natural monopoly? This is our technical definition of sub-additivity, okay? And, uh, so uh, I will discuss that further on today, in particular uh, in, in how far this also means that we should or will have uh, uh, actually a monopoly providing this market. And the other point in terms of uh, inelastic demand, an unregulated monopolist would try to set or would, be, would just set the price as, as high as possible. And so, as always, just tell me if there are any problems uh, with the stream or with the sound or if any. Okay, uh, just give me a, a, a thumbs up in the in the YouTube stream uh, if it works. Okay, so uh, you see, we will do that further on, uh, less uh, chaotic uh, in the future. But I just want to have you uh, looking into uh, these parts. What I'm going to do now, of course, what we want to do now is to start with uh, today's lecture. Uh, and without further ado, I will, I will start. The only point uh, which is, might be a slight problem today, I have somehow a sound or there is some sound problem with the economics of regulation course. Uh, as always, I will uh, run it at 125% uh, of the speed. Uh, I will make some, some comments as always. And if there are any questions, just interrupt me in WebEx, just ask, okay? Okay. So welcome back to our Economics of Regulation class uh, course. Uh, last week I started with the introduction and uh, giving an overview of and a refresher of perfect competition and monopoly. These are the benchmark structures we, uh, we always look into once we discuss our industries, our network industries. And what I did then was starting and giving you an overview of the important concepts of technology and cost. Uh, I gave you this overview of uh, the production function and how to derive uh, from the production function the cost function and what that means then for profit maximizing behavior. What we also discussed were some concepts related both to the production function, economics uh, or returns to, to scale and in particular what is more important for economics uh, of regulation and of network industries is the concept of economies of scale and of course we also introduced the economies of scope well, actually that's what we are going to introduce today i was uh, too quick uh, what we introduced was the scale economy index which is just uh, average cost over marginal cost so we have economies of scale if uh, average costs are downward sloping and above uh, marginal cost and pretty much the last thing uh, the last thing i did uh, last uh, Thursday, I think, uh, was introducing the concept of, of uh, sub-additivity. And that's where I'm going to jump to right now if I, I find the respective 
uh, slide, yes, that's where we are now. I introduced subadditivity. Subadditivity uh, simply is uh, that the cost, if I produce total inter industry output in one uh, company, is smaller than if I produce it uh, in number or several, that is at least two or more companies. That's what we have, and that's actually our technical definition of what is called a natural monopoly. Simply meaning that industry output Q can be supplied cheaper, that is at lower cost by one firm than by two or more firms. This is a technological definition, and from that it does not immediately uh, follow, or in no case immediately follow, that, uh, that uh, we will actually have a market structure with only a single firm active. We will discuss that in much more detail later on once we get into, uh, into contestable markets and so on. Okay, here you see uh, what I just uh, told you again about subadditivity. Okay, that's what we have. Uh, I also gave you this smaller side that uh, subadditivity not necessarily implies uh, implies uh, falling um, or decreasing average cost. That's what you uh, saw here, even though you might uh, go up with the cost uh, after some level. Still, it's cheaper to have only a single firm providing the whole industry output X1 here, rather than two or more, which would then have, if that's just uh, X1 over two, if that's then just, uh, uh, half the output. And uh, remember uh, our tutorial class on Tuesday where it was very important what the relevant ranges for whether economies of scale are. Of course, I don't know whether uh, Phil talked to you about that, uh, but I guess, okay? Uh, still uh, active. And uh, because what we saw is if uh, that was the example with, with, the, with the capital K, with the fixed capital, if, uh, for instance, uh, the demand curve would go through here, uh, we would see over the whole range, economies of scale, if the demand curve were out here, we would have several firms in the market and no more subadditivity. So that's what's important uh, with uh, respect to the relevant range. Okay, uh, but now we move on to multi-product firms. Multi-product firms, what we already uh, discussed on, on Tuesday in the tutorial class was a multi-plant firm, which sets up several plants because each plant has a specific uh, uh, capital input, and of course, uh, if it's uh, rather small, you rather set up several several plants. But now we move on to multi-product firms. Uh, in today's modern industries and, and economies, many firms make multiple products, and I gave you just a few examples here. Uh, my uh, examples uh, in, in the remainder of this part will basically be uh, ones where I use different models of Volkswagen. You see Volkswagen produces dozens of models and has, I don't know how you call that, three or four brands. So they have Skoda, they have Audi, they have Seat, and they have the Volkswagen brand themselves, and they have subcompact cars like the Apti Polo, uh, the compact cars like the Golf Sedans, uh, like, oh, I don't know what, what the Passat is, more like, a, I think, a hatchback or how, how they ever uh, call this. They have the Touran, they have the two SUVs like the Touareg, so they produce multiple products, many different uh, products. Uh, same three of is an American company uh, producing uh, very many different products. Most uh, all of you will know the post-its, okay? Uh, but they, they also certainly produce face masks and so on. Uh, Deutsche Bahn and, and Deutsche Telekom, that's interesting from our viewpoint of uh, economics of network industries. Deutsche Bahn provides both uh, train services, passenger train services, local train services for passengers, for distance train services for passengers. They provide freight services and they provide the network infrastructure services from Deutsche Bahn Nets. Deutsche Telekom also provides you with broadband internet services, with mobile telephony services, with fixed line telephony services, and so on. So you see today many firms are multi-product firms and now we immediately run into trouble once we look into costs. What is a cost of a car or what is a car at all uh, which Volkswagen produces? How do you define average cost? for uh, these firms. What is the average cost of a car produced by Volkswagen? Uh, and that's uh, what, what we are going to look into right now and look into economies, or, or first of all, look into to economies of scale for multi-product firms. So what is rather straightforward is uh, to provide or to, to, to somehow estimate or, or, or measure the total cost for a uh, uh, two-product firm. So produce, uh, as I told you, uh, I myself drive a Volkswagen Turan, so I will just give as an example the Turan and the Polo. So here uh, you have these uh, two cr products here which you produce. The marginal pro uh, cost for product one should be rather clear. So what does it Volkswagen cost to produce one additional Turan car or one additional uh, Polo? Okay, 
uh, the problem is that you cannot say what are the average cost of cars because the cars Volkswagen produces are made up of both of Purans and, and, and which is a larger car with probably higher uh, production cost than the smaller car like the Polo or the Up. Okay, so what is the average cost of a car? And therefore, in order to, to define that, we introduce the concept of ray average cost. This is a more restricted definition, and in, uh, you will immediately see what this means. Okay, ray average cost assumes that a firm makes two products, the Turan and the Polo, uh, in a given quantity, in a given ratio. Okay, so uh, suppose all of the cars uh, Volkswagen makes, uh, they are made up of two, uh, uh, two parts uh, Polos and one part. Uh, to run. So, uh, yeah, actually, I should have uh, used the Golf and the Touareg. Hopefully, all of you know these these cars. So you have a, a car which is produced at a high percentage and a car which is a, a produced at a low percentage. So the average uh, cost of a car, of course, would change if you increase uh, the production of Touareg, leaving uh, the the production of 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 Golfs constant. Okay. So the problem is here. In order to get a measure of this uh, average cost and economies of scale, you need to keep this uh, ratio constant. And so if you keep the constant, uh, then you can, uh, of course, you know, if you uh, produce 3 million car and one, one third is Touaregs and two thirds is Golfs, then you know uh, two, you will produce 2 million uh, Golf and 1 million Touareg. If you produce 6 million, just yes, use this uh, for simplicity, you will have 4 million Golfs and, and, and 2 million Touaregs. And then, so more generally, you should, could just use some, some ratio lambda, lambda 1. And, and lambda 2, where lambda 1 plus lambda 2, the sum is simply uh, 1. So lambda 1 would here two, be 2 thirds, and lambda one, uh, 2 would be uh, 1 third. And of course, implicitly, uh, then uh, the, the output is defined here. You know immediately, if you don't know lambda 1 of the golf, and you know the total number of cars, you know how many golfs are produced. Okay? And the ray average costs are then just the total cost, taking into account that if you produce 6 million car 2 million of the car uh, excuse me 4 million of the cars will be golfs and 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 uh, uh, 2 million of the cars namely one third will be will be Turex, divided by the total number of the car and now if uh, you know exactly what these average cost of a car are if you say have 9 million because then you know uh, average cost per car uh, uh, for, for if you produce 9 million car or something, like say 30,000 euro, and you know of these 9 million, two thirds are golfs and, and one third are, are, uh, are Turex. Okay, so that's uh, just a, hopefully you, you, you got this uh, point. You have to keep this ratio constant. Otherwise, if you don't keep it constant, of course, uh, the cost per car will change simply because you change the composition. Of course, if, you, if the share of Turex goes up uh, in, in, in your composition, the cost per car. Uh, then would uh, would change. Okay, that's why it's so important to to keep these ratios fixed. And if you have this, you can also produce uh, or or derive a scale economy uh, index for the case of multiple product firms. Okay, for multiple products. Here's just I uh, uh, repeated uh, or give give you again the. Uh, definition of the scale economy index, simply average cost over marginal cost. Here we put it slightly different. As you will see, that's what we are going to use here. So for the multi-product firm, uh, in taking this, this second definition here, in a numerator, you simply have uh, the, the, the total, total cost. And uh, in the denominator, what do you have here? You have marginal cost weighted by the output for each uh, for each product okay so this is simply a weighted measure of of uh, of marginal cost where each uh, marginal cost uh, for say product one uh, uh, weighted by the output of uh, of uh, product one this becomes even clearer in the next step where we just derive both actually that's what we do here I, in order to to make this more confusing here probably uh, here I just de divide both the numerator and the denominator by Q uh, of course this is just an expansion which is, is valid here and what you get then is Q1 what you get then here is Q1 over Q here and here in a numerator in a you cannot see my in a numerator you get the Q and that's what you have then here again okay and Q1 over Q this expression down here is nothing else than our lambda one okay yeah, and I now erase it again, otherwise you will be too confused here. Okay, uh, but, but you see how we come up and now you see also why this is a, a weighted sum of marginal cost. Okay, and the weights are the production shares. So you know uh, one third is Touareg, so uh, the marginal cost of Touareg gets a one third uh, as a weight and the uh, Golf is two thirds, so it gets uh, two thirds 
uh, as a marginal cost. And in the in the numerator, what we have here is ray average cost. Okay, because here uh, we determine each output of, of each uh, each uh, single product as a function of the total output. Again, so you know if we produce nine million cars, two thirds will be gods, and so on. Okay. But one, uh, it, this is completely analog uh, to the single product case. Uh, and of course, that's what I, I stress frequently. We keep the proportions, we keep the output proportions fixed. Uh, and we now can simply derive uh, the ray average cost. Okay, that's what we have. The ray average cost enter here uh, in the numerator. Okay, and now we can, yeah, uh, here, what we now have here is uh, we can, and that's what you will do, we can just simply calculate the ray, uh, whether there are economies of scale. Okay, uh, because we know if uh, Volkswagen uh, doubles uh, its, its car production, we will see how, how that changes. Okay, Th that's uh, what, what uh, you will do in an example where you, in, in, in a problem in, in the tutorial class where you just can simply calculate that. Okay. Uh, I don't know here uh, later on I will get an uh, example uh, when once we look into into uh, economies of scope but uh, hopefully this should be clear the only point you have to do is uh, you just increase here uh, or in order to to have the s you just calculate it of course but uh, uh, in order to have some some uh, some some uh, analog to the average cost curve the decreasing one you might just increase the q Hopefully that is clear with respect to ray average cost and uh, now and how we, we derive the S, the scale economy index in this case, because we now turn to a second uh, way to uh, define multi-product economies of scale, namely incremental cost or average incremental cost. Uh, so the point is in, in certain uh, instances, it might not be uh, appropriate to look into uh, proportional changes in, in output, Actually, uh, or for instance, in the notes I gave an example of Volkswagen again, uh, the question is if you have a uh, convertible like the EOS or uh, if you have, uh, uh, or is that a multivan like the Charan and you don't uh, produce a lot of them and you know you have some product development cost, of course, it's interesting to you to also have an idea of the average cost and how it evolves over the output range uh, for these uh, for the single product, for, for the single model of uh, which you produce. And because this gives you an idea or should give you an idea how much you should uh, produce or how much you need to produce of, of that uh, car given a certain willingness to pay of consumers so that you reach the break even. Okay, just, uh, perhaps I get back to this example later on, but just let me define what incremental costs are. The incremental costs of producing product one given product two. So. Uh, again, the incremental cost of producing a Touareg if you produce already a Golf. And what are the incremental costs? These are uh, the total costs if you produce both uh, the Touareg and the Golf minus the cost if you produce only uh, the Golf, that is nothing of the Touareg. So this gives you the incremental, the additional cost, and this is defined like this here, uh, I see uh, as a function of Q1 for a given value of uh, uh, Q2. So this is the incremental cost. What are the additional costs if you, first of all, don't produce nothing of a certain product and then a certain, a certain uh, uh, amount? And of course, here, uh, if you produce nothing, that's a zero here. If you produce nothing, uh, of course, you don't have any product development cost. That's, uh, that's the, the, the assumption here. Okay? And uh, average incremental cost would then be just the whole thing divided by the respective output Q1 okay, for our, our Turex. And if AIC, the average incremental cost, is declining, uh, in, in Q1, okay, is declining in Q1, where are single product economies of scale in a multi-product context? And that's actually what's written in this article by Der Spiegel, uh, which I have here in, in the notes. Uh, I think it says that uh, the EOS only sold, I don't know, uh, the EOS sold only 8,000 uh, units, and that was uh, in, in 2013, and the Charan 40,000. And now, of course, it's really clear that the AIC, given that you have product development uh, cost and some other fixed cost specifically for the Charan or for the, for the, for the uh, EOS here, uh, the, the point is that you will have uh, really decreasing uh, average incremental cost here. And obviously, uh, it was not enough here uh, to, or in, enough demand given the average cost or the cost you have here, so that uh, these were really pr uh, profitable, uh, profitable uh, car models, okay? Uh, so, and at that time, 
the point is what, what this uh, article also states that for, for these numbers of for these quantities, it just doesn't pay to, uh, to uh, pay the development cost uh, for, for a new car, which are uh, at, a, at, a, at a magnitude of several hundred million euros. Okay. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> we will get back to this uh, discussion of incremental cost and average incremental cost because the concept of incremental cost is very important uh, in European regulatory practice. In particular, uh, what is called ELRIC, long run incremental cost, is a cost concept, uh, is a cost concept heavily used by the Euro com uh, European Commission and all of the member states in the regulation of telecoms. Okay, and in, in German it's 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 Kell Kosten der effizienten Leistungserstellung, uh, which is uh, slightly differently uh, defined. But we will discuss that in more detail uh, in the, in the tutorial class because we will have uh, actually I could show it even to you. We will have uh, the assignment if I find it, of course. Yes, here it is. Uh, <clears throat> we have assignment two, where I ask you to if I get it here. You should now see assignment two, and here, uh, here you have uh, you should uh, look up what what Elric is long run incremental cost, and there is something which is called Elric plus. You will notice that, and Kel uh, is only relevant for Germany speaking uh, students, but uh, you should nevertheless get an idea of these concepts which are uh, used in in European regulatory practice. Yes, so it's also here in uh, this year's assignment. Okay, problem set. Okay, getting back uh, to our uh, discussion of economies of scale. Uh, actually, uh, this was a discussion of economies of scale. Now we move on to economies of scope, which is somehow after having muted myself, I will move on with uh, the, the stream. Okay. Oh, the more interesting concept once economies of scale. Now we move on to economies of scope, which is somehow the more interesting concept once we define or once we discuss uh, multi-product firms. So what are economies of scope? Uh, economies of scope exist if it is less costly to produce a set of products in one firm than in two or more firms. Uh, the formal definition here for the two goods, uh, goods case uh, makes use of what is called the standalone cost, which I briefly introduced already on the previous slide. The standalone cost of producing the Golf uh, is just, if I produce nothing else, C output of Golf C Q1 and the other output is zero. The standalone cost for, say, the, the Touareg would be then C, I produce no Golf, so it's zero, and uh, I produce only the quantity of, of the Touareg. Okay? And economies of scope exist if the, the sum of the standalone cost, so here, output uh, standalone cost of producing the Golf, standalone cost of producing uh, the Touareg is smaller than if I produce all that in a single company, okay? If that's greater than zero, we speak of economies of scope. Hopefully this is somehow clear. Of course, uh, yeah, we will get back to that. If you look and, at a company like Volkswagen, which is amazing in the sense that it has so many brands, uh, this would also mean uh, Two economies of scope exist in a sense that uh, if this is Audi, if uh, product one is Audi in a sense, product two is Porsche, product three is Seat, uh, does it make sense to have uh, it all in a single company or are the costs higher than, uh, so are the costs lower if I have it in a single company uh, if uh, compared to, to uh, if I have separate companies, okay? Uh, we would have uh, economies of scope if the costs of having all these different brands and different models in one company or if we would have global cost for, for uh, global economies of scope for Volkswagen, if uh, these costs are lower, if they all ha are in one company. Okay, uh, now we can also uh, define such a scope economy index, uh, which is actually the same as what we had previously here in a numerator, just divided by the cost. So it, it's not so interesting to derive this scope economy index because the critical value here is, 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 is zero, uh, where it's uh, larger than zero or smaller than zero. And you see already from, uh, this uh, term up here, you you already get uh, the, the respective uh, sign of uh, this index. Okay, no economies of scope uh, if this is smaller than zero, economies of scope uh, if it's larger than zero. That's interesting uh, uh, to look at uh, the, something like our industry history through this lens. Perhaps some of you remember a firm called uh, Daimler Chrysler, where uh, 
uh, I think Schramm was the CEO at that time uh, of, of uh, Daimler, uh, um, Daimler Benz acquired uh, Chrysler and uh, obviously it turned out that it was not a good deal because it split up again later on, okay? So it, it's not so straightforward to determine whether there are really economies of scope because uh, as you will see, you might also have a trouble uh, to have too many, uh, to, to, uh, to, to manage too many different brands within your, or products within your portfolio. But now we will move on to look into what are the sources actually. Uh, um, uh, slide ahead. We will look into the sources uh, a little bit later. First of all, we define or, or uh, uh, you, uh, define another cost concept, namely the common cost, Gemeinkosten in German. Uh, this is then uh, what you really can also define formally here. What are the common costs? The common costs are just total cost minus the incremental cost of product one uh, minus the incremental cost of product two. Uh, so, uh, and now what, what I did in, in, in the next uh, line is just substituting the definitions of these uh, common costs here, okay? Uh, here you see this is the incremental cost of product one, and this here is the incremental cost of, of product two. And if you simplify that, you see that this uh, uh, is thrown out, and so you get plus C0, uh, Q1, plus C, uh, Q2, and I have to erase it again here, so, you, so otherwise you don't see it. Uh, and what you see here, the common costs are simply uh, the, the sum of the standalone cost minus the total cost, or minus the, the cost if you produce this in, in one, uh, in one uh, company, okay? These are the, the common costs. The point is, and, and I think this uh, is what, what, what we explain here, the common costs are the costs that cannot be allocated unambiguously to the production of a certain product or service. Just think of, of cars, uh, typically all these cars have the same engine in it. So you commonly produce, uh, you, you, you develop one engine for say 10 different models of car. This is then uh, uh, some like a public input or actually it's, it's, this is more like a, a shared input well, it's a good it's a good discussion, but it's more like a public input. So the point is here with the engine, it actually would be a public input. Uh, you produce this engine, or you put it differently, you develop this engine once, and then you can use it in all. So the the concept, the the, the kind of the engine. Of course, you have to produce it all of the time, but you can uh, produce the the, the blueprint. Uh, you can use the blueprint for all different cars. Okay, once you develop this engine for one car, it's costly available for the use in all others. Okay, and so if you have then standalone production, you have to develop an engine both for your Turan uh, and for Touareg. Touareg probably has not the same, uh, same engine as, as, as uh, the, the Golf, but the Touran certainly has. So you can use the same engine in your Touareg, uh, in your Touran, excuse me, in your Touran and in your Golf and in your Passat and so on. So if you produced it once, if, excuse me, if you developed it once, you can use this blueprint then for all others. And this is a public input and this is what you save, okay? Uh, and we will also discuss shared inputs and I think I just uh, move on to the next slide because I explain it in more detail there. So slightly, uh, this is slightly different from a public input, this shared input. Uh, these are inputs which are used in a production of several products and usually result from indivisibilities and lumpiness. I will move on here. Uh, you see that here uh, because I explain it in, in more detail, uh, detail here. Same equi equipment for various products is shared inputs. So if you have once a railway track from Gießen to the Vogelsberg, you cannot only use it for, for passenger train services, you can also use it for freight services. Okay, uh, if you uh, have produced and, and uh, uh, shared, here I have some, some uh, examples, I think, uh, shared advertising, creating a brand name. If you have created your brand name Apple and you, you bring out a new product, you can already use this brand name. Okay, and marketing and R&D expenditures that are generic. So here marketing expenditure, this is actually what, what we already have. So uh, if you see a Daimler uh, advertisement uh, in, 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 uh, on TV, uh, they often don't uh, show you the exact car. They just give you some nice uh, landscape and then they give you the Mercedes store and so on. And of course that then uh, makes marketing or, or, or advertises all of the, of the Daimler cars and maybe even the trucks. R&D expenditures, so if, uh, that's if you, uh, or, or if you uh, invest something in R&D in terms of say new, new batteries, uh, you might then use these new batteries not only in your cars but also in your trucks and so on in several other uh, respects. So these would be uh, shared, shared inputs. Uh, 
cost complementarities are more related in a sense to our public inputs we, we, we just have. Okay. Uh, so producing one good reduces the cost of producing another oil and natural gas, for instance. So if you see these oil wells, or if you actually in former times you could fly across uh, or over the, the Arabian Peninsula, and what you see there is that they burn all the natural gas which comes out of the of the of the ground once they they dig for oil. Okay. Uh, so here you see you typically get oil and natural gas together, and if natural gas is sufficiently expensive, and if you care for 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 CO2 emissions, you probably wouldn't burn just the natural gas, but try to somehow use it uh, and then capture it and then uh, sell it. Okay. So this is from production. Uh, this is more little like a cost complementarity. But uh, the the interesting thing is here. Uh, that's why I use this. Uh, this this uh, illustration, crude oil. Crude oil is really an interesting public input. Uh, this is now the English version. Here I have the, the German one as well. Crude oil would be raw oil. And you produce many different things which have, oh, whatever uh, these temperatures are in Germany, it's Schmelzpunkt. Uh, it's not a boiling point. I, I don't know what is in, in English. But from crude oil, you get out all these kind of different things. A gas would be then uh, like flüssig gas, propane, and, and butane. And you get you you, you get uh, you get here a gasoline. You get diesel oil. You get these these heavy oils and so on. You get asphalt. You get everything from the single output. Okay. Uh, the, the point is, you put that in, and you get the other things automatically. You would have to to throw them away. Okay. Uh, so oil and benzene and so on. Uh, this is a bit like the cow. Okay, if you have a cow, it produces both the milk and the meat and even the leather with, with, from the hides. Okay, this is also a, f a famous example: the cow of uh, economies of scale, which is a, sc a scope which is even used uh, in a, in a book by Boma Panzer and Belief. The final thing uh, which I want to mention here uh, is computer software and computer support. Uh, actually, I'm not so convinced about that because that would mean that people who, who write the computer software are also good at providing support. If you look at as SAP, uh, they always uh, hire uh, guys like you, like business administration and economic students to explain to their potential users and, and customers uh, their software because uh, typically I, get, uh, I, I guess that the nerds writing software packages or I don't know whether they are able to, to communicate at all, but uh, certainly they typically have uh, a hard time uh, ex uh, explaining, explaining how the software works for uh, consumers. Retail, yeah, I, I, I leave that here. Uh, Okay, another short break because we now finish this cost concepts and we'll now discuss the sub additivity uh, before we move on here. I just ask for questions in WebEx. Okay, uh, so that was already uh, to the force, uh, rather, rather quick. I think I, I just make a very short uh, break here before I move on and, and, uh, and uh, discuss what that means in terms of sub-additivity and just ask in WebEx whether everything is clear. Okay, it seems that there are no important questions right now, hopefully. Hopefully you understood all that. Probably the, the the real advantage of providing that on YouTube is that you just can move back later on and and watch it again. Uh, okay, multi-product firms, multi-product firms, uh, and sub-additivity. So here we uh, in 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 the context of economies of scale, we introduce sub-additivity in order to look for our natural monopoly. Is it cheaper to produce a single product within? or the total output of a single product within a single firm or in several. Now the question is, uh, under what conditions do we obtain sub-additivity in a multi-product firm? So should we produce all car uh, in a single car company? That's more or less like what we had in a former uh, uh, Eastern, Eastern communist uh, bloc where uh, uh, we, you had huge conglomerates which were the only ones to providing a certain services. Okay, and, and now here are to be just looking for the technical definition, of course, because uh, that uh, it, it means that the sub-additivity technically does not mean that it's optimal or that it's going to happen that we have a single firm being active, as I explained to you in some detail when discussing economies of scale. But now we want to discuss this topic of sub-additivity in the context of multi-product firms. And of course, then we have to look into how economies of scale and how economies of scope interact. And now the point is sub-additivity uh, of the cost function uh, and therefore natural monopoly requires that we have both 
economies of scale uh, and economies of scope. You might also put that more different uh, or difficult as, as JOSCO did it here. Uh, it requires both a form of multi-product cost complementarity and a form of multi-product economies of scale or at least some range of the output. So here uh, some form, you learned about two forms. So you learned above about the re, uh, re average cost and you learned about the average incremental cost. So we need one of these or maybe there are some other definitions and we need uh, economies of scope. Okay. And that's what we are going to discuss here. And actually, I could jump back again to say uh, uh, the, our, our problem set, our assignment. Uh, you will see, I think, uh, you will have to discuss uh, some, 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 uh, something like this here in, in, the, in the assignment anyway. Okay. Uh, so these are just examples. So the most easy or the easiest example you might come up with economies of scope uh, is just the following. And I put it here. If you have C is equal to some f plus q1 uh, plus q2. So this would just mean uh, you have some uh, fixed product development costs. Suppose these are cars. You have some product development costs, which are common costs for your, for your uh, say, Golf and, and, and Touareg. And then you simply have such a linear uh, cost function. And of course, this would be economies of scope because it's cheaper uh, to produce uh, because the F is really a common cost here. You would have it twice uh, if you produce both uh, standalone. And it also has uh, economies of scale because, of course, uh, due to this F again, uh, if you uh, increase, uh, and for instance, the array average cost, if you increase the output, if you uh, keep uh, that constant, uh, the, the, the ratio, you could do that just by doubling Q1 and Q2. You would see that uh, divided by Q, uh, this, this part uh, stays constant and uh, the, the parts with respect to the Qs and the F over Q gets smaller. Okay. Uh, that, that's the easiest example. We will have more uh, examples here. Here we have in particular, I think this is slightly uh, too small pr uh, font here even for the slide here. But what you see here, this is really a strange example. Here you would have uh, economies of scale because you have the one third up here. But of course it would be stupid to produce the two uh, products in the same uh, in the same or, or yeah, produce the same product, in, uh, the two products in the same company because this adds some some penalty here. If you produce uh, this, it adds a penalty here uh, and adds some cost. If you would produce it uh, standalone, you would just have uh, C uh, is equal to Q, C1 is equal to Q1, and C2 is equal to Q2. Actually, uh, perhaps this was what happens happened in the Daimler. You, you might really think that this is really strange, but perhaps this is what happened in the Daimler Chrysler case. Okay, uh, you added another company; they both were working more or less uh, well. But the point is, you got so many troubles on the management board uh, that this added uh, so many frictions that the cost just increased. Okay, that's what we have here. So you have economies of scale, but no uh, economies uh, of scope, and therefore it's better to produce. Uh, this separately. Uh, here, uh, the, the, the second example here, this one, uh, the, the second with the global sub additivity, uh, I think, uh, oh, I, I could just check here. As you see here, this is, I think, almost the, uh, the same thing. And uh, what I ask you in the, in the tutorial class is to, the, to look up uh, economies of scale and economies of scope for this function. So you will, uh, you will be able to check whether uh, you, you understood this concept. And if there are problems, we will just uh, move on discussing that in detail here, okay, on, on next uh, Tuesday in the tutorial class. Okay, uh, it's actually the same, so I shouldn't discuss it too much, otherwise you don't have anything to do. Okay, so now the point is, uh, first of all, you should be able to determine uh, if you get such a, a cost function, whether there are economies of scale and whether there are economies of scope. The next question then, of course, is under what circumstance do we get global sub-additivity, meaning that we really should produce all these products where we have some economies of scope in a single company from a technical point of view. Okay, Always only from a technical point of view would production cost be lower if we produce it in, in a single company. And uh, this is rather complex. That's again what, what Chosco uh, states. I gave you a, a quote uh, in the notes, the necessary and sufficient conditions for global sub-additivity of a multi-product cost function are complex. And it is not particularly useful to go into those details here. Okay, uh, 
if we were in the 80s, we would spend uh, hours and hours discussing trans rate convexity, uh, convex in the 80s, I mean the 1980s, okay? So when I did my, my studies, we would have uh, discussed uh, these, these conditions at, at some length, uh, but uh, it turned out that you do not learn so much uh, from that. The important point is that some economies of scope is a necessary condition for a multi-product cost function to be sub-additive. Uh, okay, so if there are no economies of scope, it doesn't make sense, uh, or if there are even these economies of scope, it doesn't make sense to produce all of uh, the different products in one company. And now, uh, hopefully, you know the distinction between necessary and sufficient condition here. If you have sufficient conditions, you know that these conditions are they are sufficient. Uh, they they, uh, they are enough to guarantee that you have a multi-product uh, cost function, but there might also be other. Uh, uh, not so strong uh, assumptions, which give you the same result. This would be the necessary ones. Okay. Of course, not for a multi-product function, but for sub-additivity here. So the point is that, uh, and I don't go into detail here, you have some economies of scope and some declining average incremental cost that's sufficient. Uh, trans rate convexity, I don't want to discuss that. Go to Beaumont's book if you want to spend uh, more time of that. Some cost complementarity. Cost complementarity here meant as a property that increased production of a, if any output reduces marginal costs of all other outputs. So if you have more crude oil, uh, it's cheaper uh, to produce uh, both uh, gasoline and diesel and so on. Okay, so if you produce more, more, more gasoline, you know it's cheaper for you to also produce more, more diesel. If you produce, uh, if you dig more oil wells, uh, it might be cheaper for you to produce more natural gas. Okay, but uh, that's, that's about it. Uh, I think we will discuss that then in more detail in uh, the tutorial class. Uh, in particular, the question is, how does that look like empirically? And perhaps you remember, uh, we had many either state uh, owned or state-managed state uh, utilities in Europe, like Deutsche Bundespost, which uh, provided both postal services and, uh, and, and, and telephone services. Uh, and the point is telephone services included not only what you have today, uh, the, the, the wires and lines uh, which connect you uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the Hauptverteiler, so to the main uh, what is it, distribution uh, center, but they also included the, 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 the endgeräte, the, the devices for the consumers, okay? Uh, you could only get uh, telephones from Deutsche Bundespost at that time. And so the point was somehow, I just want to show you my great Telekom Austria uh, telephone from uh, 1995. At that time, this was the only kind of phone you could get, okay? You see, it, uh, I don't know, this is a touchpad. Great. And to add, it still works without any problems, okay? Oh, this is all part of this big, large uh, natural monopoly and sub-additivities everywhere. Uh, actually, uh, there is no or surprisingly little empirical evidence that there is a huge uh, cost of additivity. Uh, typically, these studies find that there is some economies of scale uh, out to a certain level of output. So if you think in terms of our Stadtwerke, our municipal, uh, our municipal electricity and, and, and gas uh, uh, companies, uh, there are some which are certainly too small. If you have only a few hundred households, uh, your, your, other, your overhead costs are much too high. Uh, uh, a former PhD student of, of mine did some study on that, uh, looking into mergers, and he saw that uh, in, in many instances uh, you, you are below some minimum efficient scale uh, in terms of the Stadtwerke, and that's why you see some, some mergers here. Uh, but uh, you, uh, if you have uh, municipal gas and electricity companies which are uh, at the level of, say, uh, several 10 or uh, even 100,000 households, uh, the, the, you probably won't see many economies of scale uh, then. Okay, uh, the, a problem here is that uh, there is a distinction between classical economies of scale and the economies of density we already discussed up there uh, when we discussed uh, railways. Uh, and it's also important in postal services and railways. Uh, I think I have to, to go back in, in postal services. Uh, the point, point is, imme uh, it, it should immediately be clear. Uh, it's cheaper if, uh, if, if your mailman uh, has to distribute uh, the mail, the letters in, in a densely populated area. Uh, and, and goes to multi-unit buildings where he has, say, uh, uh, 50 letterboxes. Uh, 
just uh, at, at one spot and it doesn't have to walk for for another mile to go to the next household but uh, just have as a distance of 10 centimeters uh, to get to the next uh, household this should be clear that these are uh, economies of density uh, so these are uh, similar to economies of scale uh, but uh, are uh, as I discussed above there, uh, the point is that you increase the number in, on railways, the point is that you increase the number of delivery points and this increases delivery density and lowers the marginal cost per delivery point. Uh, I think I describe red in, in much more detail uh, in, in the notes, okay? Uh, the point is in the notes, I also gave you uh, 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 an evaluation from an article by Fass and Waverman in the Handbook of Telecommunications Economics uh, on, on econometric cost functions. Uh, and uh, the, the point is here, even though we have some evidence, the evidence is not so clear cut. Okay, uh, it, it's not so easy uh, to, to determine whether you really have this uh, global uh, sub additivity, whether you have both on, in a respective or a relevant range, whether you have economies of scale that might be uh, that might be, be easier to determine, but what about the economies of scope? Uh, and, and what they state is that the econometric evidence uh, survey, this survey has appeared not to influence regulators' decisions guarding uh, permissible market structures. The problem is basically that uh, these uh, uh, models always require, uh, require a leap of faith. It's not so clear uh, whether uh, the results are really robust, okay? Uh, in another dimension, uh, we have this problem right now. How much do we trust these uh, virologists and, and their models? Okay, there's also a leap of faith, but here we rather uh, uh, make an error uh, which is conservative in a sense that we go for the safer uh, solution. Okay, uh, here uh, in, in public play, in, it's always a, a problem in these kinds of public policy proceedings. Uh, if it's about to change something, uh, that you have to say, okay, the change wouldn't. Uh, uh, wouldn't uh, do some something bad. Okay, now I think uh, I I come in a sense uh, to a conclusion of this part here. I just need to show up. Yes, a conclusion of of this part here. Uh, so what we now discussed at long time uh, was uh, the technological and cost attributes that imply that a single firm can produce. Uh, output at a lower cost than multiple firms. This was our de definition of a natural monopoly. This was our deficient, uh, definition of sub-additivity. Okay? Uh, now, the point is that, and I, I stressed that many times, and that's why I put up this JOSCO uh, uh, quotation once again, uh, that you have this technical natural, uh, this natural monopoly in a technical sense does not mean that it, you get automatically a market uh, to evolve to a point where we get a monopoly, actual monopoly, and at the same time, it's not uh, clear that uh, you really should have one that, from a normative point of view. Okay? Uh, and, and so, because uh, that, that's what we will discuss later on, even though it would be cost efficient to have only one firm, it might be from a, from a, from a competition or social welfare and, and regulation perspective be better to have several firms in a market. Okay, in particular, given the asymmetry of information. So the point which is stated here is that uh, many offers do include a definition, do, do include in their definition of a, uh, a natural monopoly the answer to the behavioral question of what cost and demand attributes lead industries to evolve uh, to, to a monopoly. Okay, we didn't discuss that here. Okay, and the, the point is here, uh, we do not given what we did, we do not get any conclusion that a single firm will naturally emerge in, in, in equilibrium and is also uh, not clear whether we should have one. And uh, what we do in the next step is whether we, uh, we, we don't address the normative question here, whether we should have one, but we, uh, we, we address uh, the positive question, whether uh, these sub-additive questions, uh, excuse me, sub-additive costs will lead uh, to a market where we have uh, only a single firm, okay? And uh, that depends on the competitive interactions uh, between uh, firms in the market and potential entrants, okay? Uh, and and that's actually what we are doing in, in the next chapter when we discuss uh, contestable markets, where we look at a, at a uh, cost structure which is sub-additive and then uh, look into how many firms will be active and what will be the performance of the market. That means how are costs above marginal or average cost or how does that look like? Okay, and uh, this I want to stress this once again. So natural monopoly in the very beginning just or in, in a very basic sense means just that we define it technologically uh, via sub-additivity and that is simply a cost concept. Okay, nevertheless many industries we look into uh, and, and in the 
in a in a channel discussion, we always speak of natural monopolies. We we when we we talk about the utilities, about electricity companies, and so on. And the reason why uh, that is the case uh, is what we turn to next, namely to sunk costs. Uh, some costs do not appear in the definition of of uh, natural monopoly. Why I said it. it, it, it oh. Excuse me, you see, you see I should make a, a break here. But anyway, I, I move on uh, till the end of, of this chapter. I think there are only left two or three uh, slides. So the point is here, uh, if we have some costs, uh, you will see that it's quite quite uh, possible that we get then a link between sub-additivity and mox, market structure because there is an income, if there's a so-called incumbent, a firm in a market which already has incurred uh, 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 the sunk investment, it typically has an advantage uh, compared to potential entrance. And so uh, if we have sub-additivity, uh, we might get a behavior and performance which leads to a natural monopoly. We will discuss that uh, in the end of the next uh, chapter. So uh, and so, if that sunk costs lead to uh, uh, really an entrenched monopoly, uh, we, we can really expect that it has an effect on market performance, and of course, we might then get an unregulated monopoly. So I will get back to that uh, importance of sunk costs many times later. Okay? Uh, yeah. Here, uh, just uh, some some definition from Chosco. Uh, we discussed that previously. So sunk costs are associated with investments made in long-lived physical or human assets whose value in alternative uses or different locations is lower than its intended use. At the extreme, an investment might be worthless in an alternative use, and in that sense, we have what is called sense what we what is called irreversible. Uh, cost. Just think of the Euro tunnel. What you have sunk there is lost if you no longer operate the Euro tunnel. Also, existing nuclear power plants. There are already sunk costs even to to dismantle them. These costs are already here. Okay, uh, and uh, the the sunk costs are different from uh, fixed costs we discussed that uh, uh, previously. We cannot adjust the respective cost, the capital cost. Okay, uh, if we have built some or if we have built some factory with machines, we might use these machines in in different in in different. Uh, uh, kind of uses. Okay, uh, so that that's what's important. The sunk parts of an investment, uh, in particular, its relevant capital costs are no longer relevant for the decisions to be made. Think of the Euro Tunnel. Uh, even though uh, the Euro Tunnel uh, operating company makes losses each year, uh, if we look into uh, what they would have to pay uh, as as uh, for for the credits uh, or for the for the capital they used to build the tunnel, as long as they manage to to cover at least their their, their operating costs and uh, to get even a, a margin on that, it makes sense to operate this 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 Euro Tunnel. That's why we had several kinds uh, or times a haircut. Uh, meaning that uh, creditors just accepted some kind of reductions in the payments made to them. Uh, what, why is sunk cost so interesting to us? Yeah, because most of the industries that have been regulated based on natural monopoly arguments, the so railroads, think of the, the tracks, okay, the most important part is not, uh, is not the steel you put in there, but the construction cost you have. Electric power, similar. Uh, the power plants, uh, they don't have much of an alternative use. The telephone is in particular the wires you have put into the ground. That's a problem with uh, with getting fiber optical uh, broadband interconnection for everyone because 80% of the cost are just the construction costs if you have to lay that cable into the ground. Gas pipeline networks, of course, they are fixed. Water networks also. Cable television is the same. The point of all of these industries is that a large fraction of their total costs are really sunk. They are sunk capital costs. And therefore, these sunk costs matter so much. So it's important to us uh, how sunk costs impact such an industry. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, uh, after. Okay. Break here, and asking for questions. The, this uh, to the force through the cost concepts. I want to make a, another short break uh, here. Okay. I move on with the next chapter: contested markets, and uh, I don't know whether we will be able to cover that today. The war of attrition, but this is also part of uh, this chapter. Okay. Uh, so. After having discussed, after having discussed subadditivity at some times, and the question uh, whether, uh, okay, put it differently, subadditivity means that it's uh, from a technical point of view optimal to have a single, to have a, a single firm, to have a single firm produce the whole industry output. Now the question is, uh, if we assume a certain market structure, namely contestable market, will we obtain 
this result and uh, what are the efficiency or welfare properties of this result. All these discussion of contestable markets goes back to a series of important papers by Bomol, William Bomol, Panzer and Willig and which ended in a, in a book, The Theory of Contestable Markets, published in 1982. And I want to show you uh, what, what they did uh, here in the next, say, 15 minutes. Uh, the point is here, the benchmark case is that we have sub-additivity, actually, as you will see here in a very simple form, fixed cost plus constant marginal cost. Uh, so we have decreasing average cost over the whole range. And we assume that there are no sunk costs. These are just fixed costs. If you don't uh, become active or if you have been active in the past, you can withdraw exit from the industry without any costs left. And uh, for simplicity, we look into the single product example and you, uh, we assume that we have n identical firms which all have these standard kind of cost functions, C is F plus C times Q. The important thing is we have one incumbent, one firm which is active in the market and all of the other n minus one uh, firms are what is called potential entrants. We, we have given some inverse market demand function, so some downward uh, demand, uh, sloping demand function where the price is a function of of uh, the, the output. Uh, the, the F is fixed, but not sunk. So, uh, and that is very specific. We will uh, discuss that later on. So firms can enter or exit the market freely without facing the risk of losing any of these fixed costs up to the point in that they, uh, the firm actually produces output Q, I, and incurs operating costs. This means that there is really hyper-free entry and exit into and out of this market and a hit and run entry strategy is possible. Uh, this, this really sounds strange uh, in a sense. So the point is, uh, if you think that your local, uh, your local electricity company uh, has too high an electricity price, including the price of the network, you just jump, jump in, uh, undercut it, and, and, uh, and get a business, okay? Uh, as you see immediately, it's hard to set up uh, an electricity uh, transmission net network uh, within seconds and, and uh, enter the market, and then if the incumbent happens to decrease the price, you run again. What might look more interesting or, or more, more, more realistic is just, uh, for instance, competition in airlines. Uh, so if you have uh, uh, one connection between, say, say Frankfurt and, and New York, and Lufthansa offers that at a high price, you might have a, a Condor plant there, and Condor says, oh, I just undercut uh, Lufthansa, and all of the customers who have uh, tickets which, which can be uh, which are refundable and so on, uh, they just go to me and, and I, I make this flight and uh, transport all the customers. And if Lufthansa turns out uh, to reduce the price as well, I just leave again as Condor, okay? So the point is you have, and this is this sounds spe very speculative and, 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 and rather theoretical, and that's uh, a, common, a common criticism of this theory, but I will get back to that. So, but the point is it makes, uh, uh, or, or it really assumes that we do not have fixed commitment costs prior to actual production. So you don't have costs for your aircraft previously. And therefore, all costs are effectively variable from an entry exit perspective. There is really no difference when, between firms that are in and that are out. But if you have that, you get a very interesting, a very interesting kind of result. Actually, what we have here is some kind of generalized uh, Bertrand competition. Now, once you have fixed cost, and uh, how does such an equilibrium look like, or what are the equilibrium uh, requirements or conditions? Uh, re an equilibrium requires a configuration which is both visible and sustainable. What does visibility mean? It means that a market clear and the incumbent uh, makes non-negative profit. So that is uh, at the price uh, the firm sets, or the, uh, which which is uh, uh, in, in the price in the market uh, demand, or you, you get a certain demand. Okay, uh, and the market's clear. That is, uh, you get a demand for what you throw in the market, and market's clear. No one is forced to buy. Uh, and uh, another point is whether everyone gets something at the ruling price, but at least. Uh, the, the, the firm can sell everything it wants to sell at this price. Uh, and the other point, I, I will uh, illustrate that in a minute in, in the diagram. And the other point is that uh, the, the incumbent breaks even, that is revenue is larger than cost. The sustainability uh, uh, criterion means that the potential entrants are not able to enter the market and make profits. That is, there exists no uh, price where I could undercut the ruling price PA, which is smaller than P, so that I could sell something for which I find demand at this. That was, that's why I was so, uh, I had a hard time to explain that up there. Here the point is that at this price you find, uh, you don't find enough customer so that you can uh, break even as an entrant. Uh, it's really better, I think, to explain it that by means of the diagram I used here, the one uh, from Chosco is actually uh, totally the, the same diagram as the one 
I used in on, on, on Tuesday in the assignment if I manage yeah oh I had this I have to, to show it once again to you uh, that's what I showed you on on Tuesday in the assignment this this is this diagram where you also have uh, the demand curve in red probably I, I should erase it but then I just draw it again okay here you have Q here you have the demand curve here you have P of course here you have the demand curve here you have some some marginal cost MC and you have some average cost uh, which look like this here okay and uh, now the interesting thing and I, I guess I should move back to to my, my slide which you see is the same here uh, the, the interesting thing here is uh, what is equilibrium now you see that we have two conditions uh, what uh, oh, what is not uh, shown nicely here is of course we, we should have something like this here and something like this as well so the AC curve goes up and somewhere intersects uh, the, the, the demand curve and of course we could also uh, put a marginal revenue curve here and what is clear this would be the monopoly price okay of course the marginal revenue curve uh, should have double the slope okay so the the distance or it should be just halfway between the, the, the x or the origin and, and the intercept of the demand curve with uh, the x-axis and I don't know whether Phil in, in the tutorial class gave you the same uh, question or the same kind of diagram but anyway uh, you have these questions which will be later on get with the different capital levels where you see the different kinds of AC curves this would be the monopoly price PM and now why is that or not an equilibrium if we have contestable markets now clearly because if Lufthansa says at a monopoly price uh, Ryanair would just jump there take all the passengers slightly undercut here slightly undercut uh, Lufthansa uh, slightly undercut Lufthansa and then take all the business Lufthansa knowing that uh, would have to reduce the price and how far do they have to reduce the price yeah certainly not as in the Bertrand paradox to price equal marginal cost because at a price equal marginal cost which would be here uh, the firm would make losses and the only sensible thing is and this is really just going back our our feasibility condition the only sensible solution is that price is equal here average cost because then you just cover your cost could a firm could an entrant and profitably enter here no because if they would undercut that there's no possibility okay no 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 output quantity no output quantities so if you produce like this you have this average cost this would be the price if you produce even more like this uh, you would have losses so uh, price equal average cost would uh, be feasible because uh, our incumbent does not uh, make losses at the same time it would be sustainable because there could not be entry the monopoly price as we had it here is not sustainable because it could be undercut however the important point is here uh, and that's what you will learn in the assignment if you solve for price equal average cost there is another solution which is not really depicted in, in Chosco's diagram which is up here where you also have price equal average cost because you have two intersections here of the average cost with the with the demand curve and of course that's not a solution either of course this would be would be a solution where the incumbent breaks even and makes zero profits but of course uh, an entrant would enter here and charge the monopoly price so this is again not sustainable yeah uh, so that's already it okay it's actually straightforward and and very uh, amazing uh, Chosco states that these are remarkable results results and what is so remarkable about that even though we have uh, a natural monopoly even though we have decreasing average cost uh, we get a result which is second best what does second best mean of course it's not first best because first best means uh, price equal equal marginal uh, cost but in that uh, if you have price equal marginal cost what is clear and I can really clutter this here uh, you would make losses and you the, the government would have to pay subsidies of this size so uh, if you face a break-even uh, constraint as a government it, the, the, what, what you get in terms of the of the uh, of the result and the contestable market is really second best okay this is as close to efficient uniform per unit pricing as we can expect in a market with private firms that are subject to a break-even constraint and have cost functions characterized by economies of scale that's uh, the the evaluation of of uh, Chosco here 
the point here is, and what's really the achievement uh, by, by Boma Panzer Willig, how many firms are active in the market? Only one. One firm is active in the market. You have realized all economies of scale. And why does this single firm being active in the market charge on, only the price equal average cost and not a higher price? Because potential competition. Okay, one firm is in a market. In English, uh, in American, you would write it like this, the one. And potential competition. Potential competition is so important. Even though these firms are not active in the market, they force by their threat of entry potential competition and the threat of entry, okay, way force the, the incumbent to charge a price which is equal to average cost. And this is really amazing, okay? The question later on, of course, is how relevant that is, okay? But here you see, and that's an important point, that uh, even though you ex uh, uh, observe only a single firm being active in a market, you have a result uh, as good as, as it gets. Okay, in terms of, of uh, this market structure, you cannot uh, as soon as long as, as no, no first best uh, uh, transfers are possible. It's the best thing you can do. And this is really remarkable. Okay, uh, hopefully this is uh, clear so far. Again, we will have uh, in the assignment uh, 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 problem where you exactly just uh, derive this equilibrium, where you derive the, the feasibility and the, the sustainability uh, conditions and where we will look into that. Uh, a small uh, aside here, uh, you might, you also perhaps hopefully remember what we did on uh, Tuesday uh, with this uh, problem. It was actually the same problem I, I just showed to you, where we have, uh, I jumped to one note again, uh, where we discussed these, uh, where, where we discussed this question uh, with, with the K. So where we had these, uh, uh, cost function and, 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 and we had the pro uh, production function and the point was that here our Q, P and actually AC, how AC looked like was really depending on whether it looks like a new shape or in the relevant range or whether it was quite different or should probably use uh, where it was quite different, something like this here always increasing, it just depended on, 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 on the capital K we had. I just have to look up how did this, uh, somewhere I have a Mathematica file. Here it is, our cost function, this is not a cost function, our cost function was uh, output Q squared over K, where K is the capital uh, in, in uh, plus K, okay? Uh, and, and this, uh, the re this was the result of Q is equal to square root K times square root L. Yeah, and, and the point is, the only point I want to make is this K here, and this K determines how uh, the, 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 the average cost here, how these, these are different average cost curves. Actually, I couldn't uh, draw much, much nicer. Uh, but uh, in, in, in Mathematica, as I, as I showed you, uh, but these are different average costs where the, the, the shape of the average cost curve really depends on this respective K here. So the one is K0 and the other is K1. Hopefully Phil presents better uh, diagrams and less chaotic uh, slides uh, to you in the, in the assignment. And now here, that's why I wanted to show you that, actually, uh, by the way. Uh, in, on the previous slide, you saw that the average cost curves are downward sloping in the whole relevant range. Remember, we discussed on, on, on Tuesday sometime what the relevant range is. If uh, demand function were going through here, we would also have a downward sloping average cost curve in the relevant range. Okay? But if uh, demand lies further outside, as it is depicted here, and that's I erase it again, uh, you might get, as you have a given uh, level of capital, you might get that the average cost is increasing again, okay? It's U-shaped, and here you see the marginal cost. Now the problem is here, you see uh, by construction here, uh, it's still better to have a single firm being active, producing this, this outcome here, uh, rather than having, say, say two firms. Actually, uh, the, the, the problem with this slide by this also took, uh, uh, I took from, from Chosco is that uh, it, it's, it's just a sketch. It's not really uh, uh, true so that it, you cannot uh, show it. Uh, the point, uh, uh, the point uh, which should be made here is that a firm uh, could enter here with this 
uh, say with this output, actually the optimal output would be the one where price is equal marginal cost. And if one firm enters with this output, enters with this output at, at this uh, average price or say at a price which is slightly lower in order to produce the whole, actually the, the, the efficient second best output, the other firm would have to produce, probably I need now uh, another color, the other firm would just have to produce, a second firm would have to produce, or the incumbent would have to produce this output, and if it produces this, this output, its costs are much higher. Okay, so the total, uh, so the cost of the one firm would be this here, and the cost, uh, the, the cost, the average cost, so, and, and the other firm would be this here, and uh, the, the problem is here with this diagram, I probably should, uh, uh, should should uh, produce one uh, here with Mathematica where it's exact. Uh, the problem is, and that's what I state in the notes, that uh, actually if you have entry here, uh, total costs increase. What does this mean here? Now yeah, you have a, a market structure where you have sub-additivity. Okay, you have sub-additivity because it's cheaper from, from a, a social point of view to produce the whole industry output here. But if you have the pot potential of entry, uh, or, or if you allow for entry, another firm might enter with a, a lower amount, which uh, is still in the range where you are have economies of scale, but not these, these economies you have right here. And uh, if entry happens here in this case, uh, it might lead to higher costs than without entry. Okay, you might get a, a worse result. That's that's a problem here. Uh, train uh, can train. Uh, uh, describes in some detail in his book Optimal Regulation. Uh, so the, the problem is here, uh, if you have such a structure, you would have uh, uh, potential entrants which want to enter. Uh, they want to enter, but you don't know whether it's a good thing to enter or not if you're uh, a regulator and wants to maximize social welfare. Uh, we will later on see anyway because uh, that we typically do not, uh, firm, uh, we do not uh, prohibit firms to enter. Uh, but uh, as a regulator, you might think about it. Okay, actually, we didn't have entry in the far distance bus uh, business in the coaches business in Germany until a few years. You might remember, or if you remember. Okay, yeah. Hopefully, this this uh, got clear. Perhaps we can discuss that uh, in in more detail or once again in Tuesday if you want to. Because uh, here the problem is that the shape of the of the curve is not. You see, uh, the C is one plus uh, Q uh, squared. Uh, and and this is actually almost uh, or very similar to to uh, what what we had. Okay, uh, I move on. Even though this might have been not so so clear as I hope, but anyway, contestable markets in a multi-product uh, world with sub-additivity. So what we will discuss in in uh, the course and what the problems and the assignments are about will be pretty much this kind of standard case. Okay, this kind of standard case where you have given some inverse demand curve, D of uh, Q if it works, and you have given some 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 uh, cost function which is F plus C times Q. That's what we typically have. Uh, very straightforward. That's what you have to uh, look into. Of course, from a from a more general point of view, it's it's interesting as we introduced this economies of scope previously. How contestable markets uh, work in a multi-product work uh, world, world and what the result will be. Now the point is uh, rather straightforward here. Uh, if it's really a global cost sub-additivity, a single firm will take all of the advantages of cost sub-additivity. This firm earns zero profits and the revenues uh, that firm earns from any subset of products is greater than or equal to the incremental cost of producing the subset of products. Okay, there is no cross subsidization in a sense that the price is charged for any product or set of products that uh, covers the incremental cost uh, to produce them. So what does this mean? If you produce, if you're Volkswagen, uh, suppose there, there will be global uh, sub additivity or there would be global sub additivity in, in the production of cars and you have several models. Now the point is here, uh, you would charge for each uh, uh, model at least its incremental cost. If you were not choose uh, the incremental cost for say the Sharan, and apart from that you earn zero profit, that means you cross subsidize the Sharan. And you, if you cross subsidize the Sharan, uh, that means some other cars, so the, the, total, the, the total amount of all other cars has to bear higher cost uh, then the standalone cost to produce all of these other cars. So the Charan is, is sold at a price 
uh, below its incremental cost, so the others pay more than their standalone cost. If the others pay more than their standalone cost, actually another firm could enter and produce at a, and undercut uh, the incumbent could undercut Volkswagen and sell at the at the at the at the at the standalone cost. Okay, cross subsidization is not possible uh, with with uh, contestable markets. And of course, uh, nevertheless, you cannot sell every every product at its marginal cost because you have subadditivity. So because you have common cost. And the point, or the theoretically interesting point, is that under certain conditions, uh, the firms will charge the optimal uh, second best linear price, which are the Ramsey Boteau prices, uh, which we will derive in, uh, I think, uh, chapter six or seven. Okay? Yeah. So given the zero profit uh, constraint, Ramsey prices are the optimal prices. Oh, what? What I just noticed is that I'm, I run out of time, but that uh, doesn't matter. I will stop here. Uh, I will discuss cross subsidization uh, next uh, next uh, Thursday. The important point today was that we were were able to uh, introduce uh, contestable markets because that's what uh, we are going to discuss in assignment two. So now, uh, going back to assignment two, you should be able to discuss all the questions we have here. Okay? Uh, I think, yeah, all the all the problem sets you, you'll find here, uh, you will be able to uh, to to discuss uh, on based on what we uh, discussed uh, or what I presented today. Okay, that that's about it. Uh, I want to thank you for for being with me. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm still available in, 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 in WebEx right now, and I just want to say goodbye. Okay, before I say goodbye, I just want to switch uh, to the slide again, which I discussed from Chosco. I said that I should prepare uh, an exact slide uh, by the means of Mathematica. That's what I did here, so this is exactly to scale. Uh, the same kind of function, the same time of problem. You see that this is really a very uh, strange problem because uh, the optimal, in in a sense of, uh, if you had perfect competition, you would have price equal marginal cost, and this would also maximize total surplus. Uh, of course, at that point, the firm here, if only one firm were active, uh, it would make profits, okay? And of course, if you have contestable markets, that's not a sustainable uh, configuration because another company would just enter. And it could just enter with this uh, kind of, of output uh, and, and selling at, at, at this price or actually then at, at a lower price or just below that. And what you see here, due to entry, you get fewer few or actually fewer you don't get these customers served okay that's pretty much the problem and i think i i should uh, stop here okay yeah that's it for today i'm available in webex for further discussion as always thank you and goodbye